Hi you five. Okay, we're reading some more of Casper. We're reading quite a lot today, okay? But lots of exciting things happen in what we're about to read today, okay? So you need to be listening to every single sentence because otherwise you'll miss everything, okay? So remember, we finished off where Johnny was reminding Elizabeth about how important this secret was to keep. Okay, remember she wrote him that letter and then you guys wrote a letter back as Johnny, okay? Okay. Remember, Elizabeth, you've got to keep stum. I told her one evening, tapping my nose conspiratorially. She liked that. So whenever she left my room after that, she'd tap her nose. Stum, she'd whisper, I've got to keep stum. And there's a picture of them tapping her nose. That means you have to be silent. Lizabeth became quite a little mascot on our corridor and quite a hero too on account of everything she'd done for Casper. She may have been a little bit on the talkative side and could be quite mischievous too. She was a bundle of fun and she made us all laugh. But I couldn't help wondering whether she might one day become too overexcited and blurt out our secret by mistake. I took all the precautions I could, asking her to always check behind her before she climbed the stairs to our corridor, and I made it an absolute rule that she spoke in whispers whenever she came to see us. Those, it seemed, were the kind of rules she was quite happy with. Lizabeth liked anything, I discovered, that involved some kind of conspiracy. It was during these long whispered conversations in my room that I got to know so, so much more about her. Actually, to begin with, they weren't conversations at all, not as such. They were more like monologues. Once Elizabeth started one of her stories, there was no stopping her. Do you know, she'd begin, and on she'd go on and on and on and on. She'd sit there cross-legged on the floor of my room with Casper on her lap and just talk and talk and talk. And I'd be happy to listen because she told me of a world I'd never seen before. For over a year now, ever since I'd left the orphanage, I'd served people like her at the Savoy, fetched and carried for them, polished their boots, brushed their coats, opened doors for them, bowed and scraped as bellboys have to do. But until now, not one of them had ever really talked to me, unless they were snapping their fingers at me or ordering me to do something. It's true that I wasn't sure sometimes whether Elizabeth was talking to me or to Casper. It didn't much matter either way. Both of us would listen as entranced as the other, Casper gazing up into her eyes all the while, purring with pleasure, and me hanging on her every word. Once she told us about the great ship she'd come over on from America, about the icebergs she'd seen, as tall as the skyscrapers in New York, which was where she lived. How one day, when they were at sea, she'd wandered off on her own to find somewhere to hide, and found herself right down below in the engine room. There was quite a kerfuffle, she said, because everyone thought she'd fallen overboard. When at last she was found and brought back to their cabin, her mother had cried and cried and cried and called her, My little angel! But her father had told her she was the naughtiest girl in the whole world. So she wasn't sure what she was. Afterwards, they had taken her to the captain of the ship, who had a great fat face and sad eyes, like a walrus, she said. And they'd made her apologise for causing so much trouble to the crew, who had been searching for her all over the ship for two hours before she was found. And to the captain, who'd had to stop the ship in mid-ocean and had lookouts scanning the ocean with binoculars looking for her. She had to promise faithfully in front of the captain never to go off on her own while they were on the ship again. She promised with her fingers crossed behind her, she said, so it didn't count. So when it got rough a day or two later and they were being tossed about in the biggest greenest waves she'd ever seen and everyone was as sick as dogs, she decided she'd do what one of the sailors had told her to do if it ever got rough to go down to the very bottom of the ship where the boat doesn't roll so much and just lie down. There's a picture of her speaking to the captain.
The very bottom of the ship, she discovered, was full of cows and calves. So she lay down beside them in the straw and that was where they found her fast asleep when the storm was over. This time they were both mad with her. So she was locked in the cabin as a punishment. She shrugged. I didn't care, she told me. Who gives a fig anyway? Back at home in New York, her governess was always sending her up to her room to make her do her writing all over again, or because her spelling wasn't good enough. There she is with the cows. She was always being sent to her room by her mother too for running around the house when she should walk or making a noise when her father was working in his study. I didn't mind, she said with a shrug and a little laugh. I didn't give a fig anyway. In the holidays, the family would sail up the coast to Maine in their three-masted yacht, which was called the Abe Lincoln. And they'd live in this big house on an island where there was no other house but theirs and no one there except them, their guests and the servants. One day she decided to be a pirate. So she tied a spotted pirate scarf around her head and went off with a spade to look for buried treasure. And when they came calling for her, she hid away in a cave and she only came out when she was good and ready. She knew they'd be mad at her, but she really didn't like anyone calling for her, like I was some kind of dog. So when she strolled back into the house that evening, she was sent straight up to bed without any dinner. I didn't want dinner anyway, she said, so I didn't give a fig anyway, did I? Bit by bit, through these stories and dozens of others, I pieced together something of the lives of Elizabeth and her family. I looked at them now with very different eyes whenever they walked by me on their way to breakfast, whenever I opened the door for them or wished them good morning. Elizabeth would give me a great beaming smile whenever she saw me in the lobby and Mr Freddy would wink at me from the front door and sometimes he'd meow softly as he passed me by. Such moments were enough to lift my spirits all day long. Life was suddenly good and fun too. Casper was well again, we had both found a new friend, and our secret was safe. Everything was fine, or so I thought. Shall I carry on? I think I'll carry on. Next chapter is called Running Wild. Ooh, that looks lovely. Everything after that seemed to happen suddenly and in very quick succession. It was a quiet weekend at the hotel with fewer guests around. There were no big dressy dinners, no grand balls, no smart parties. All of us who worked there preferred it like this, even if the days could drag on a bit. Everyone was more relaxed. I liked the weekends anyway because Casper and I usually saw more of Elizabeth then. She'd be bored out of her mind downstairs and would often sneak up to see Casper, sometimes three or four times a day, leaving me a note each time. I finished work earlier on a Sunday, so usually she'd be up there in my room with Casper waiting for me when I got back. Sometimes she'd steal away some scones and cake, hiding them away in a napkin. She was always saying I was too thin and needed feeding up, and since I was always more than a little hungry after work, I didn't argue with her. We were sitting there one Sunday evening, tucking into some delicious fruitcake, when I heard a voice in the corridor outside. School face! It was school face! She was talking to Mary O'Connell and she was not in a good mood. That idiot boy Johnny Trot, is he in? I haven't seen him, Mrs Blaze, Mary told her, honest. The footsteps came closer and closer, the bunch of keys rattling louder with every step. Schoolface was ranting now. Do you know what's that he's gone and done? Well, I'll tell you, shall I? He's only used a black brush on Lord Macaulay's best brown boots. There's black all over them. And who gets the blame? Me. Well, I'll have his guts for garters, I will. Where is he? I don't know, Mrs Blaze. Honest to God, I don't. Mary was doing her best for me. The footsteps were right outside my door now and there I was with Elizabeth in my room and Casper cleaning himself on her lap. All she had to do was open the door and I'd get the sack for sure. 
I could hear my heart pounding in my ears. I was praying that somehow, anyhow, Mary would prevent her from opening that door. It was this very moment that Casper chose to stop washing his paws and spring out of Lizzie's lap, yowling in his fury. It wasn't his gentle meow. This was his wailing war cry, and it was shrill and loud, horribly loud. For a moment or two, there was silence outside the door. Then, a cat! As I live and breathe, a cat! cried Skullface. Johnny Trot's got a cat in his room? How dare he? How dare he? It's against the rules. My rules. I looked aghast at, Eliz at Elizabeth. Without a moment's hesitation, she picked up Casper and dumped him unceremoniously in my arms. In the wardrobe, she whispered. Get in the wardrobe, quick! Once in there, I crouched down, stroking Casper frantically to calm him down, to stop him from yowling again. Then I heard something I simply couldn't believe. Casper was yowling again from outside the wardrobe, from my room. Yet he couldn't be, because he was with me, inside the wardrobe, in my arms, and he definitely wasn't yowling. Yet he was yowling, I could hear him. In my panic and confusion, it took several moments before I realised what was going on. Lizabeth was out there in my room and mimicking Casper pitch perfectly. Mary told me afterwards, she told everyone afterwards exactly what had happened. Apparently, Lizabeth opened the door to Skullface, yowling and wailing at her just like Casper. Skullface just stood there gaping at Lizabeth. She could not believe her eyes. It was a while before she could speak at all. Her mouth opened and shut like a goldfish, Mary said. Then Skullface gathered herself a little. What on earth, young lady, she said at last. What on earth do you think you are doing up here in the servants' quarters, young lady? It's strictly out of bounds. Lizabeth yowled back at her. I'm a cat she said quite calmly in between yowls. I was chasing a mouse and he ran in here. So I ran in after him and I caught him. I'm very good at catching mice, you know. I gobbled him up just like that, one gulp. I've got to tell you, he tasted just wonderful. Best mouse I ever ate. Bye. With that, she yowled at the astonished Skullface and skipped off down the corridor, still yowling as she went, past Skullface, past Mary and the others, all of whom by now had come out into the corridor to see what all the fuss was about. Skullface, it seems, then stuck her head round my door, took one quick look into the room, slammed the door furiously behind her and stormed off down the corridor, fulminating as she went. <clears throat> Children, wretched children, she fumed. If I had my way, they wouldn't be allowed in the Savoy at all. Nothing but a nuisance, a perfect nuisance. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's a spoilt child. And an American spoilt child is the worst of all, the work of the devil himself. Running wild like that all over my hotel? How dare she? She stopped and turned round, wagging her finger at everyone. And you tell that Johnny Trot, when you see him, that he will apologise to Lord Macaulay and polish his boots again. This time I want them nutty brown and shining, not a trace of black. And he's to come and show them to me before he returns them to his lordship. At once, at once, you tell him. How we laughed in the corridor when she'd gone. We were doubled up and aching in our stomachs with it. Lizabeth, who was already a great favourite with everyone up there, had now become a matchless heroine to us all. Her quick thinking, her brazenness and her fearlessness had saved the day. Probably saved my job too and most certainly saved Casper from being taken away. But it was only the next day that this same fearlessness nearly cost her her life, and mine too come to that. It was from Casper that I first learned something was wrong. He was always happy to see me when I came upstairs after work. He'd be lying there on the bed, his legs in the air, his tail swishing, willing me to tickle his tummy. I came back to my room to see him at about 11 o'clock, my usual time, my first work break of the morning. I was hoping Lizabeth might be there with him, but this morning she wasn't, and neither was Casper lying on my bed. 
Instead, he was pacing the room and yowling again. He was in a very agitated state, leaping up and down and off the windowsill. I'd seen him do this before if there was a pigeon strutting up and cooing at him from the parapet outside the window. But there was no pigeon. I tried feeding Casper. I thought it might calm him down, but he wasn't interested. Clearly, nothing mattered to him except whatever was going on outside the window. So I climbed up and opened the window wide enough for me to crane my neck so I could see all the way along the narrow gully in both directions. No pigeons there either. That was when I spotted Lizzie I could see at once what she was trying to do. She was on her hands and knees and climbing out of the gully up onto the roof tiles. Ahead of her was a pigeon hopping ever upwards on one leg towards the ridge of the roof. Its other leg hung useless. Lizzie was following it, cooing as she climbed, stopping from time to time to throw it some crumbs, trying all she could to entice it down. She seemed quite unaware of the danger she was in. Do you think Lizzybeth is trying to do? Do you think she might be trying to help the pigeon? My first instinct was to shout at her, to warn her, but something told me that, that to alarm her at that moment was the worst thing to do. Instead, I climbed out of the window, closing it behind me so that Casper couldn't follow me, and crept along the gully, trying not to look down over the parapet and down into the street eight stories below. Lizzybeth had almost reached the ridge above me, but by now the pigeon was hopping away from her along the ridge towards the chimney stack. I climbed up after her. Only when I was right below her did I venture to call out to her, and then only as softly as I could. Lizzybeth, I said, it's me, it's Johnny. I'm right below you. You mustn't go any higher. You mustn't. She didn't look down at first. She just kept climbing. It's the pigeon, she told me. He's awful hurt. Looks like he's broke his leg or something. That was the moment she looked down. Only then did she realise just how high she actually was. All her fearlessness left her in an instant. She slipped at once and clung there, frozen with terror. The ridge was only a short distance above her, but I could see that she wasn't going to be able to get up there on her own. Not now. And that there was no possible way she could come down either. Stay right where you are, Lizzybeth, I told her. Don't move, I'm coming up. All I could think of was that somehow I had to get her up onto that ridge. We'd just sit there until we were seen and rescue came. But between me and her was a steep, tiled roof. Acres of tiles, it seemed. And with no foothold, nothing to hold on to. One slip, one loose tile, and I'd be slipping and sliding back down the roof and probably over the parapet. It didn't bear thinking about, so I tried not to. That was why I talked to her all the way up as I climbed. I wasn't only trying to calm her fears, I was desperately trying to calm my own. There they are on top of the Savoy. Just, just hang on, Lizzybeth. Look up at the pigeon. Whatever you do, don't look down. I'm coming. I'll be right there, I promise. I climbed as fast as my shaking legs would allow. I went sideways across the tiles like a crab, zigzagging up the roof. It was longer, but it made it easier, safer, less steep. I just fixed my mind on reaching that ridge and climbed. More than once, I dislodged a tile and sent it crashing down into the gully below. Then at last I was up there and sitting astride the ridge. Now I was able to reach down, grasp Lizzybeth by the wrist and haul her up. We sat there facing one another, safe for the moment, but both of us breathless with fear. The pigeon was quite oblivious to all that had been done to help him. He hopped one-legged back down the roof, along the gully and then up onto the parapet, pecking away at the crumbs as he went. He flew off quite happily. Someone must have been watching all this drama unfold because the fire brigade came soon enough. There were bells clanging in the street below and firemen in shiny helmets began to appear all along the gully below. One of them taking to talking to us all the while, telling us again and again not to move. 
The truth is that neither of us could have moved even if we'd wanted to. They ran ladders up to us and lifted us down, Lizzie first. When at last I was carried in through the big window at the end of our corridor, I saw it was crowded with people. The hotel manager was there, Skullface, Mary, Luke, Mr. Freddy, everyone. As I walked by, they all began to clap me on the back. It was only then that I really understood what I'd done. The manager pumped my hand and told me I was a proper little hero. But Skullface wasn't clapping. She wasn't smiling either. She knew something wasn't quite as it should be, but I could tell she didn't know what it was. I smiled at her though, defiantly, triumphantly. I think I enjoyed that moment more than all the back slapping and handshaking, although that was fun too. They laid on a celebratory supper for me down in the kitchens that night and sat me at the head of the table. They sang, for he's a jolly good fellow, over and over again. We had quite a night of it. After a while, the manager came to fetch me away. He was taking me up to the Stanton's rooms, he told me, because the family wanted to thank me personally. When I was ushered in, I found the three of them lined up in the sitting room to greet me, Lizzie in her dressing gown. It was all very formal and proper. I stood before them, trying all I could not to catch Lizzie eye. I knew that just one look between us could give everything away. Young men, Mr. Stanton began. Mrs. Stanton and I, but most of all Elizabeth, of course, owe you a very great debt of gratitude. Suddenly I saw, and I could not have been more surprised, that there were tears in his eyes, and his voice broke. I had never imagined that men such as Mr. Stanton could ever cry. Elizabeth is our only child, he went on, his voice charged with emotion. She is very precious to us, and today you saved her life. We shall not forget this. He stepped forward, shook my hand, and presented me with a large white envelope. No money could ever be enough, of course, young man, but this is just a token of our deep appreciation for what you did, for your extraordinary courage. I took the envelope from him and opened it. In it were five ten-pound notes. I had never in my life seen so much money. Before I could say thank you, or indeed say anything at all, Lizabeth was standing there in front of me, holding out a large piece of paper. I was looking down at a picture of Casper. I drew it for you, she said. She was speaking to me as if we hardly knew one another. She was an amazing actress. I like drawing pictures. It's a cat. I hope you like it. I did it for you because I especially like black cats. And on the other side, you can see... She turned the paper over for me. On the other side, I've done a picture of the ship we're sail sailing home on next week. It's got four big funnels and Papa says it's the biggest, fastest ship in the whole wide world. It's true, isn't it, Papa? What do you think the ship is? She's called the Titanic, Mrs. Stanton added. It'll be her maiden voyage, you know. Isn't she the most magnificent ship you ever saw? And there's the picture she drew. Okay, so now it's getting interesting. The Titanic, wow. Okay, so what you are going to do for your task now is I've created a grid for you. So... On your grid, on your Google Docs, you have three columns, okay? So, the first column is called um, character. The second is actions and the third is traits. Okay, so I've already filled one in for you, okay? So, I have done um school face and i've done her action is barging down the corridor or storming down the corridor and then we need to think about 
because remember when Skullface, um, she was angry about the boots and she was barging down the corridor. So what does that tell us about Skullface's personality? What trait does that make us think that Skullface has? Okay, so I think it tells us that she's got a bad temper. She's angry. Okay, so I'm going to write bad tempered. Okay. And then you're going to do some others. So you could do Johnny. Uh, an action he did in this chapter was saved Elizabeth. Elizabeth's life by climbing on the roof. And this tells me that Johnny is heroic. He's a hero or he's courageous. Okay. So you're going to do, I want you to do 10 of these. Okay. You don't have to do 10 different characters. You can have different actions and different traits for the same character, but I want you to do 10 in total. Okay. Okay. 